As I prepared this lesson for you, I was excited to get to do it because we were talking about what I've called the long and winding road. But we actually have gone through part one and we're on part two today of Moses and the Exodus. Now here's the theme behind this class. The Bible... <clears throat> The Bible is a book of sorts, but it's actually a collection of a lot of different holy writings or a lot of different books. And they're not just a collection of things that some Jews and Christians a long time ago decided would be useful. The understanding that we have as people of faith is that this is God's message. There is purpose behind this. There's something to read beyond simple plot. This is not simply an instruction manual for how to live your life. There's a very core central message. And if we get that message, then we'll get so much more, not just out of the books, but out of our walk with the Lord. If we don't get that core message, it will distort how we understand the book and it will distort how we understand the Lord and it will distort how we live our life of faith. So understanding the core message of the book is central. And you can't understand the core message of the book simply by reading the New Testament. You can't understand the core message of the book simply by reading the Old Testament. You need to understand the core message that God has to say by reading the message, the whole book. And what we find when we read the whole book, if, if we go to the Elmo for just a moment, um, Paul, in the book of Romans, Paul is addressing a, a, a church that's made up of a lot of Gentile Christians and a lot of Jewish Christians. And he's trying to figure out how to help them mesh together. So one of the core understandings that help us understand that book of Romans is that Paul's writing this letter to a church where the Jews had recently been kicked out of Rome by Caesar. But they've been allowed back in. And once they left, it just left Gentiles in the church. Once they came back, they're trying to figure out how to fit back together. And in the process of that, Paul uses this analogy. Paul says that... Our faith is like a tree, okay? This, uh, those of you who've been in here before know I can't draw. That's a tree. It's not bad. Add some leaves there. Okay, it's getting worse. If I had used green and brown, you would so know that was a tree. Here's what Paul says. Paul says, you Gentile Christians which I'd say is probably 95% of us in here. You are a branch that's been grafted into the tree. You are the branch that's been grafted in. See, the tree is the tree that is what we're reading about and studying in the Old Testament. It is a tree of God's work with and through and revealing through the Israelites. But it's a tree where the roots of it are these Old Testament books and the Old Testament people. So you have the Old Testament books, you have the Old Testament people, but what you really have is the Old Testament message. And that's the key, the message. Because it is this message that defines who we are. You can, that, that Jesus was never an afterthought. Jesus wasn't a plan B. 
Jesus was not God thinking, oh man, I got to come up with something here. What am I going to do? Hey, I got an idea. I'll incarnate. No. And so when we read the Old Testament, if we read it with understanding, we see God laying down tracks, laying down prophecies, laying down stories that explain what Jesus is going to be coming and doing. And so when Jesus is resurrected and he's walking down the road to Emmaus with some of his followers, he starts with Genesis 1 and he explains to them how if they understood their Old Testament scriptures, they would have understood who he was and what, why he came and what he came to do. And that's what I'm calling the long and winding road. We're just taking time to work through some of these Old Testament passages that help us see more clearly. They give us the glasses now to see more clearly who Jesus is and what God said Jesus would be coming to do. Now, within the saga, if I can use that word, of the Old Testament narrative, there is perhaps nothing that I enjoy speaking about more clearly than Moses and the Exodus because the picture is dramatically one of Jesus. So here's where we started it last week. We said, and this is your, not last week, this was three weeks ago, so that's why you get a little review. That and the fact we have a lot of people who were not here who are just in for the holidays. So the Ten Commandments, we know the movie, we've seen the movie. But did you realize that Moses is the greatest character in the Old Testament in so many different ways? The Old Testament, these first five books are called the five books of Moses. And so you've got these five books all about him. There's not another character in the Old Testament with five books. David? Well, you get a little of David in in. Kings, you get a little bit of David in the Psalms. David may come close, but really nobody. So these five books, they're also called the law, the Torah in Hebrew. These first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, are known as the five books of Moses. They're about Moses. Four of those books tell the story of his life. All of them except Genesis. Moses was the leader for Israel out of bondage. Moses was their liberator out of Egypt. Moses was the lawgiver. God worked through Moses to give them the law. His encounters with God in the Old Testament are not equaled by anybody else's. He has an encounter with God where, where it, 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 it so transforms his face. It's like he's radioactive afterwards. He's glowing and he has to wear a veil. His encounters with God were unparalleled. And so we've got the foundations of the Moses story in Genesis. They set up the issue of, of, of God's message and what's happening and who are the Israelites and where did they come from and how did they get to Egypt to start with. So we've got those foundations and then the second book of Moses is the story of Moses and the Exodus. We call it Exodus. The third book is the, the, the book where Moses is giving the rules for the Levites. That's the sons of Levi, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. The sons of Levi are going to be the priests. And so they get the rules and we call those, we call that book Levi Ticus. Or Leviticus, because it sounds like it rolls off the tongue better that way. But in Lubbock, it would be Levi Ticus. Um, and I'm not going to mention the football game. The book of Numbers is the fourth book. The book of Numbers is, is one of, of where Moses and the people are unified into a nation of faith. They get counted off. They get numbered. 
And they become one nation of faith in numbers. And then the last book is Deuteronomy. And that's the book that gives Moses' speeches and his final instructions to the people. And if we focus on that book, we find that, that Moses doesn't say he's the end of the story. Moses says that a prophet like me, a prophet from your midst, from Israel, from your brothers, the Lord your God will cause to arise. So God's going to cause a prophet to arise before the Israelites, out of the Israelites, a prophet like Moses. And that means in, in, not in power, because Jesus is more powerful, but in the sense that Moses is someone who does a lot of things. Lawgiver, liberator, leader. He's not simply a prophet who goes and sits on a tower and, and meets out prophecies for the people. He's engaged. And when Moses said there's going to be one like him who's coming before you, you've got to listen to him. That's at the end of Moses' life. This is a prophetic word from God. This is informing us as it informed the Jews, or the Israelites, excuse me, they're not Jews yet. As it informed the Israelites, watch, be on the lookout. Someone is coming. Someone who will be anointed. The Hebrew word for anointed, Mashiach. In Greek, it's Christos. Someone is coming who will be Messiah, who will be anointed, who will be Christ. And like Moses, he's going to be engaged and he's going to do these things. And you need to be paying attention. And we talked about this because at this whole prophetic idea is one that wasn't met even as the books of Moses were finished. Moses dies at the end, so someone edited and put them together. But if you look at it, the person who did is clear. No prophet like Moses has arisen in Israel since. Moses knew God face to face. Moses was sent by God to Egypt and Pharaoh doing signs and wonders. He did a awesome and great deeds before Israel. See, the, the, the prophet like Moses isn't simply going to be someone who can tell your fortune. If he's going to be like Moses, he's going to be someone who knows God face to face. He's going to be someone who's sent by God to redeem God's people. And God's people need a redemption far beyond the slavery in Egypt. Genesis laid out the original problem. We are slaves to this sin that we're born into. That's where we really need redemption. The real promised land is not found within the confines of territorial Israel. There is a land of promise for all who would follow God. But we need someone to liberate us from our slavery to sin because sinners don't go to that promised land. And so this prophecy is already laid out there. This is going to be someone, and they'll do signs and wonders. They will do the miraculous. They will exhibit the power of God. And so we've got all of that. And if we, we, we take it and we look at it, we look at Moses in the foundation. But for all Moses was and all he did, Moses never could solve the problem of Eden. The whole exodus, the whole nation of Israel, that's not the solution to the problem of sin. If it did anything, it taught people what sin was because they got the law. They got all of these commandments. They got that they're supposed to love the Lord thy God with all their heart, soul, and mind. How many of you have done that? Zero. I don't care how holy you are. I don't know anyone, anyone holier than my wife. 
But she doesn't love the Lord our God with all of her heart, soul, and mind. She comes closer than most anybody. Love your neighbor as yourself. How many of us do that? Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Well, I don't say GD. Well, good. But that commandment means a lot more than don't say God lightly. That commandment means don't take his character lightly. Don't take who he is lightly. The name, Shem in Hebrew, Hashem, the name, the name means your reputation, your character, what you've done. It's your CV, it's your resume, it's your stud sheet. Don't take God's essence lightly. Well, we all do that all the time. So Moses could not solve the problem of sin. He helped identify the problem. He didn't help solve it. So we've got like in Genesis, the Israelites, this book of beginnings, and we've got it. But all it's doing is setting it up that humanity, men and women, we were made with a purpose. We were made to be in a relationship with God. But through disobedience and the problem of sin... We are not able to. So there needs to be a solution, and the solution is God's solution. And He said it, and He said it early, and He said it frequently. God says there's going to be one who's going to come through the seed of woman, and He, and the, the Hebrew specific, it's singular male, He will defeat Satan. And so we're looking, and, and this is the chain, and it's going to come through the offspring of woman. And it's going to then be, come through Abraham, and then it's going to come through Isaac, and then it's going to come through Jacob. And all of these are the stories in this book that gets us ready for Moses. And then Moses, who starts out in Israel, or I mean in Egypt, in Pharaoh's household. Moses gets Basically, he's, he, he gets in criminal trouble. And so he's on the run. He, he was a flight risk. <laughs> Didn't surrender his passport, and he took off. And he encountered God on Mount Sinai. God says, take your sandals off. And God says, I'm going to send you back and I want you to set my people free. I want you to lead my people out. Moses says, I can't do that. And God says, I know, I'm going to do it, but you're going to be my vessel. Moses says, oh no, you're not strong enough to do it through me. He, he, didn't, he worded it more spiritually. <laughs> but that's what he said. I mean, it's more spiritual to say, you know, like we can all say, well, you know, I'm just not good enough for God to use. Do you realize if you say that, what you're really saying? You make it sound real spiritual. But what you're really saying is, is God's not strong enough to use me. So God says, yeah, Moses, you probably can't do it, but you've got a stick. I'll use your stick. That's good enough. Just throw the stick down. It'll turn in. I'll turn it into a snake. Pick it back up. Stick it in the Nile. Spread it out across the sky. Touch the Red Sea. Hit the rock. I don't need you, Moses, except to carry the stick. I can do it with a stick. Are you good enough to carry the stick? And Moses is kind of like, okay. We talked about this last week, and I don't want to go into more detail, but I did want to point out that the burning bush that supposedly has been around, at least it was identified as the burning bush, we can go back to about 325 A.D., it's the same bush that's still there. But you will notice the fire extinguisher in the corner. <laughs> which tells me I'm not sure they're convinced it's the real bush. <laughs> Just found that humorous. So Moses goes to lead the people out of, of, of slavery. 
And this gets us to where we're picking up new material. Moses is told, uh, uh, you know, to, to try and persuade the Pharaoh. And so Moses does. And he's got all of these different events, all of these different opportunities to persuade him. And, and these are plagues that he calls down. And when he calls the plagues down, the first plague is an easy one. He turns the Nile to blood. Now, that's not maybe that big of a deal to y'all, but if you're in Egypt, the Nile is the life source. And the Nile represented one of their gods. So to turn the Nile into blood is to defeat their god of the Nile and to affect their, their livelihood. And it's not a good thing. But it's not good enough to persuade Pharaoh to let the people go. So then, God says, okay, do it again. This time, tell them we're bringing frogs. And this is like being inundated by TCU alums. <laughs> Nobody wants that. <laughs> but it's not good enough. I mean, the land stinks. It's, it's, it, 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 it's, it, but it's not good enough. So Moses uh, does not meet success. Plague number three, gnats. Now, we've just left TCU with gnats, and we've gone to, I don't know, like OU or something. It's, it's a pest, it's, it's bothersome, but it's not good enough to let the people go. Then we go to flies. I've got no college for you. <laughs> then we go to livestock. This is where all the longhorns died. <laughs> then we go to boils. Doesn't do it. Then we go to hail. Doesn't do it. Then we go to locusts. Doesn't do it. Then we go to darkness. Doesn't do it. So there needs to be the tenth and final plague. The Lord said to Moses, one plague more I'll bring upon Pharaoh in Egypt, and afterwards he's going to let you go. He's not just going to let you go. He's going to drive you out. He's going to want you gone. So go plunder the Egyptians. Go ask them for things. Because that's we're going to need those things. And the Lord gives the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And so the Egyptians give to the Israelites the jewels and the gold and the, the fabrics and the yarns and the livestock and the things that the Israelites are going to need for the journey and not just for the journey, for building the tabernacle, for building the worship place of God. Because you'll see that God provides all of the materials for God to worship and commune with the women and men. And it's no different today. And so God says to Moses that about midnight, I'm going to go out in the midst of Egypt and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne even to the firstborn of the slave girl, even the firstborn of the cattle. There's going to be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there's never been nor ever will be again. Now that is a fearsome and awesome picture. And some people will recoil at that picture. And some people will say, what kind of God would do such a thing? Those are people who haven't spent enough time understanding the significance of the Genesis story. Because if you've studied the Genesis story, you understand something. You understand that the sinful condition of humanity is a cancer. It's a cancer with no cure. 
It's a cancer that eats away. It's a cancer that can produce the Adolf Hitlers in this world. It's a cancer that can produce horrors in this world. And we look at it as civilized people, most of us, if not Christians, at least in touch enough with the Christian society that we grew up with, that we're appalled by such things. But there are areas in this world where Christianity does not touch, where there is evil that is true, genuine evil, that would more suitably help you recognize there comes a time where evil needs to be destroyed. And, 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 and if there's redemption, praise God, he's in the redeeming business. That's what he's look, that's what he's dying for. But there are times and places where sin is so bad, it will on its own produce death. And we get that from the story because it is Pharaoh himself who calls out, in a sense, this punishment for the people. So, God says, but the liberation is going to come like this. Let's go to the Elmo. Exodus chapter 12. Lord said to Moses and to Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month will be for you the beginning of months. Huh. It'll be the first month of the year. Tell all the congregation that on the 10th day of this month, let's make that a little bit bigger. Tell them on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house. If the household's too small for a lamb, he and his nearest neighbors will take for what fits. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Now, blemish there is not just um, a defect. He, he's, don't, 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 look, don't take the cull. Don't take the one you're trying to get rid of. Don't take the sickly one. Don't take the one that's probably going to die anyway. You take the most perfect lamb you have. It needs to be a male lamb. And then you're going to sacrifice it. You're going to kill your lamb. And then you're going to take some of the blood and you're going to put it on the two doorposts. Doorpost, doorpost, and the lintel, the top of the houses in which they eat. And then they're going to eat the flesh that night. It's going to be roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And God says, when you do this, let's get it over here. This is the Lord's Pesach, Passover, because I'm going to pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I'm going to strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I'm going to execute judgment. I'm Yahweh. I'm the Lord. But this blood's going to be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. No plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This isn't a one-time thing. God doesn't want the people to forget. This is a symbol of what's to come in Jesus, and the people need to practice this because they need to be looking for it. This is a memorial day. You're going to keep this as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. And he lays it out exactly how they're going to do it and, and, and do it as part of the holy assembly. And if you're not going to do that, you're going to be cut out from Israel. This is to be done forever. And Moses goes and he calls the elders and he instructs them to do it. Now, you're not going to get a more clear picture or image. 
if we go back, you, you're, you're, when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you. Do you see that by the blood of the lamb, people were released from their slavery to Pharaoh and delivered to the promised land? Paul said it this way in Romans, you who were once slaves of sin, having been set free from sin and become slaves of righteousness. There is a slavery where sin holds us and that can only be broken. That sin, in Romans 8, 1, talks about the law of sin and death. It's a law. It's an irrevocable law. It's one the Supreme Court or the Court of Criminal Appeals can't change. Nobody can change it. You sin, you die. Oh, what kind of God would do that? A pure and perfect God who cannot allow sin with all of its decay, all of its cancer, all of its problems to thrive. It is sin that alienates us from the pure God. And so the pure God has to do something with the sin that is just because God's just. God's got to do something with the sin to stop the alienation. We can't do it. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, look, there's a deeper slavery here and I'm going to come and there's going to be a male lamb without blemish, a perfect male lamb that's going to be sacrificed so that when I see the blood, I can pass over and deliver you from your slavery into the promised land. And that's what we have. In fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians calls Jesus our Passover lamb. He's the one that was slain before the foundations of the world in God's cosmic, I'm not caught up in time, Godness. And that's the liberation. That's the solution to the Genesis problem. That's the solution to our alienation of sin. That's what keeps us from suffering the death. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, death, where is your sting? It doesn't have it for us. Because in Jesus, we share not only in his death, but we share in his resurrection. So Pharaoh says, go, get out, get out. I don't want to see you ever again. And the Israelites are led out through the blood of the Lamb. And they take Joseph's bones with them. And I love that because what, what's happening there is Joseph had died 400 years earlier. But this is tying the story. This is letting the readers know. This is letting the, the listeners know. This is letting the people who watch the movie know. The story of Moses is tied to Genesis and the problems that are set forward in that book. They're tied together. Now, Pharaoh has a change of heart. He's got the world's largest military. And he realizes that he and his people have just been fleeced. And he's none too happy. And so he decides he's going after them. If you ever go to the Cairo Museum, go look at the mummy, mummified remains of Ramesses II. Now some people say, well, I thought he got washed away in the Red Sea. No, no, no. He was a good general. He sent his troops in. <laughs> Read the text. Doesn't say he went in. But it's kind of stunning to look at Ramesses II. Right there, laying down. This is real history. It's history with a purpose, though. 
And so you've got Pharaoh and his army bearing down and, and the Israelites are trapped by the Reed Sea. What's to be done? Moses can't do anything, but boy, his stick can. So the waters are divided and the Israelites go through the sea on dry ground. So in the process of leaving the slavery, the bondage, if we're using our analogy right, which is a biblical analogy, so it's okay to use, we're getting released from the bondage to sin by the blood of the Lamb. And then we pass through the waters on our way to the promised land. Paul put it this way in Corinthians. Our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And so as Christians, we have baptism as that right that God has given us. That rite of passage that symbolizes not only a, a, a death to sin, but a new life, a cleansing and a washing as it separates us and moves us in toward the promised land. So the people go through, and this is a wonderful thing, right? And then they begin their wilderness wanderings. And I'd love to tell you that they were the whole time just singing, uh, you know, walking down heaven's road, going to lay down my heavy load. But no. They were a bunch of whining, moping. Oh, oh, oh. The food's really bad. Can't, well, we, we had leeks and onions by the Nile. So what does God do? God says to Moses, I'm going to rain down bread from heaven for you. Now look, this is God. This is God, right? God can cause bread to spring up. God can cause bread to come out of a cave. God can go bam! And there's bread magically appearing on the table. No. The bread for their life comes from heaven to feed them. I want to show you what Jesus said in John 6, he had an interesting encounter. John 6. Um, Jesus has uh, fed the 5,000. And um, then he's gone to the other side of the sea uh, into Capernaum. And there's a lot of people on the other side that are looking for him. And they find him, uh, Rabbi, when did you get here? And he says, oh, you're, you're, you just want more free food. Don't work for another loaf of bread. Don't spend your time and energy trying to get free food right here. Work for the food that endures to eternal life. That's what I can give you. And they say, well, what do we need to do to be doing the works of God? I love this. This is just so typically us. Works, plural. You know, just tell me, give me the list of things to do for God. And Jesus changes it to a singular. And he says, this is the work of God. You put your faith in him who God sent. They said, well, what sign do you do so that we can see and believe you? Give us a sign. You know, our fathers, they ate the manna in the wilderness he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said, truly I'll say to you, that wasn't Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. God did. And not only that, it's my Father who also gives you the true bread from heaven. 
Think of true in this sense as, as pure, real, something beyond the mere morsels that you're eating. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is saying all of that was a symbol. That was a prophecy. That was a prophetic moment in your history that you've been commemorating and remembering forever. But don't understand it wasn't Moses. The bread came from heaven. It came from my Father who has sent you a bread of life that will give you true life. And Jesus, in case they're numbskulls, makes it even more clear. I am the bread of life. Ego a me. By the way, serendipity? No. God? Yes. You know Jesus was born in where? Bethlehem. We're coming up on Christmas. Bethlehem, right? Bethlehem is two Hebrew words. Beit, house. Lechem, bread. From the house of bread came the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, won't thirst. That was their other problem in the wilderness. I said, you've seen me and you don't believe. And he goes on to talk about how he is the son of God and, and they need to believe in him. So the Lord rains down from heaven bread. But we've got to understand that that's Jesus. And if we missed it, then go back and look at John again. Because I told you Jesus fed the 5,000. And then he goes over and he's over at Capernaum. And the people meet him up and say, how'd you get here so fast? John inserts a story between feeding the 5,000 and Jesus explaining that he's the bread of life from heaven, that he's the meaning of the manna. Do you know what story he inserted? Jesus walking on the water. Because you see, Moses, as great as he was, had to put his stick in and let God divide the water so they could walk through on dry land. Jesus is greater than Moses. Moses. Don't need to divide the water for Jesus to walk to Capernaum. He just walks on the water. And that's why John inserts the story there. John wants us to see. I mean, this John 6 is all about the Exodus and how Jesus fulfills the Exodus. But he doesn't just fulfill it, he exceeds it. And that's how he takes us. Now, they were not just hungry, they were thirsty. Moses strikes the rock and water comes out for the people to drink. Jesus in John 4 has already covered this. In John 4, woman at Samaria, she's drawing water. And in the process of drawing the water, Jesus asks for a drink. And she says, what are you doing asking me? You're Jewish. Y'all won't have anything to do with Samaritans, much less women of Samaria. Jesus said, oh, if you knew the gift of God and who was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked me and I'd have given you living water. She says, you don't, you don't have a bucket. How are you going get, to get any of that? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well. He drank from it himself. Jesus said, look, anybody who drinks of this water is going to get thirsty again. But you drink of the water that I'm talking about, you'll never be thirsty again. Water that I'll give you will spring up to a well that brings eternal life. And the woman, pretty sharp at that point, she says, Okay, I'm in. I'm tired of making trips to the well. Give me this, give me this uh, unending water. Jesus is the living water. 
Jesus is the manna. Jesus is the sustenance. Jesus is all of these things because a prophet like Moses from your midst, God's going to cause him to arise before you. And to him you need to listen. But no one had done that as of the time of putting together those five books of the Old Testament. No one had done that as of the time of the, the next section of Old Testament scriptures or the last section, the last prophetic section. Still says that we don't have the one yet, the promised one yet. There hasn't been a prophet like Moses that's arisen in Israel that knows God face to face, that is sent by God, that, that is doing the signs and wonders like Pharaoh and what we had here, doing these awesome and great deeds before God, Israel in God's mighty power until Jesus. But Jesus does all of that. So we're about out of time. I'm still going to hit some more of these scriptures because we've got so much more to cover. But right now, let me skip to our points for home. You guys have been great. I appreciate your attention. And next week, I hope we'll finish the Moses story. We've got some really cool stuff to talk about next week. So please, 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 if you aren't, aren't part of this class and you don't have a chance to come, it's live cast on Facebook. You can also catch it once it gets posted. And there, I've got written lessons as well. Here's your points for home. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. That's great news. We, we've got to... So, hey, how many of you have sin? I got away, it's gone. Where you're not responsible for it anymore. Where your true moral guilt is forgiven. Now you may walk around shameful, but that's from Satan. Because your true moral guilt is forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. See, when the Lord sees the blood, He's going to pass over. And that's real good news. Because Jesus is the bread of life. Now I ask you. I ask you, who's going to pass away or who's going to pass over that, that chance? Who's going to turn that away? All right, next week, let's continue. So with that, um, can I bless you in the name of Jesus? And uh, we're through for the day. Father, thank you for the chance to watch the tapestry you've woven through real history in our world and in our individual lives. Don't let us be so narcissistic, Lord, that we fail to respect and appreciate the grandeur of your epic work to redeem us from the sins that we carry. Take them off of our shoulders. Bear the punishment. Remove the alienation. We have so much to be thankful to you, Father. May all who hear this message walk out embracing your lamb and rejoicing in the life that you've given us, living it to your glory. In Jesus, amen. See you guys next Sunday. God bless you all. <music>